let's talk about exploration. Exploration means that we are able to distinguish between data and code. Usually IDEA is going to do it for you, mostly in the case of very famous processors like x86 series. Everywhere in this course, most likely when you are going to open a file, a binary L file, it is going to be parsed automatically. How does it actually happen? It's very simple. Inside the L file, there is information telling how to parse the file and which parts are data and also which parts are code. However, sometimes you might want to change it. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. Let's begin with this example. Let's say that we want to turn this part into a string. We click on A and it turns into a string. If I want, I can undefine the string using U. And I get this question whether I want to undefine the current data item or not. I click yes and it becomes data again. If I wanted, I could think about it as something else, like maybe as one byte or one word or one D word or one Q word. I make these changes using D and it's some kind of a carousel. It begins with a byte, then word, D word, Q word and goes back to byte. I'm going to undefine it again and change it into a string. And this part actually does look like a keyword, so I can change it into a keyword. Sometimes you might mess something up or accidentally undefine some part of the code. And usually it is easy to fix. Let's say that I accidentally undefined this instruction. So the function is not going to look very well at this point. If I press space, I can see that something bad happened and I have something red here. I click space again and I'm going to fix it. I want to change back this part into code. I'm going to do it using C, the C key. Now it seems to be a bit better it still complains about something. Let's see if, if we manage to fix it. I'm going to undefine this whole function. Great. And let's try to define it again with P. Seems to be about right. Usually, at least at this course, you are not supposed to do those kind of stuff. But I just wanted to make sure that you know that you can. Everything that you see here inside IDA, you can change. You can change any part of the code into data and every part of the data into code, at least if you do manage to parse it as code. Let's take a look at the various windows we have inside IDA. First, I'm going to close some of the search results. So the first window we are already looking at is the disassembly window, which is just this window. We can see it here. If you ever want, you can open another one. So view, open subviews, disassembly. And now you get another one. This can be useful if you want to take a look at two, two things at the same time. For example, if I want to be here and at the other view, I want to be here. And I can switch between them very quickly. The next view I want to show you is the hex view. Let's move it here. So this is the hex view. I'm going to close the second IDA view. The hex view is always synchronized with IDA view. This means that if I go here, for example, I can see that the bytes here are 48BF and at the hex view, I can also see 48BF. I think this is a moderately good hex editor. If you want to have a good hex editor, probably it's a better idea to use a standalone one. But what's nice about this one is that it is always synchronized with the IDA view. Next, let's take a look at the functions window. It contains all the functions inside this code. In a real project, you will usually have 
thousands of functions. This binary is very small, so we have only 26 functions. Most of them are already known, like fclose, starland, and so on. Most likely, the functions that we are interested in are the non-pink functions, those functions, and we can see that they, they are not known to IDA, so they have no name. We can sort the functions here, for example, by length or by start, and a click on any function will just get us there. The next interesting window is the strings window, which you can get by clicking Shift plus F12, or from this menu, open subviews, strings. This window shows various strings from the program. You can actually configure what kind of strings you want to see. I think we have it here in setup. Here you can change what you want. Usually the default is going to be OK. This is pretty much the same as what you will get if you use the command strings on x1. Actually, maybe here we have a bit more. One thing that is pretty useful about the screen inside IDA is that you can click on some string, let's say, for example, this one, and you can get immediately two xrefs to this string. So I can know immediately who uses this string, at least most of the times, if the analysis went OK. Two other important windows are the imports and the exports. Imports are all the functions that this binary relies on. So just by looking at the imports, we can have a good idea of what this binary is actually capable of doing. For example, we know that this binary is probably going to do something related to input because it has fgets and it also has fdopen. Most likely it is going to read something as input from the user. We can also see that the functions starland, memset and printf are being used. Printf means that most likely this program is going to print something to std out to the screen. Exports are the functions that this binary exports to the world. So we have here only basic stuff because this is an executable binary. It's not a library or something like DLL in Windows. It's just a simple binary. So the basic export from this kind of file is just an entry point. Start. Another window which we are going to use, I think, a few times throughout this course is structures. It allows us to create new structures and then use them inside IDA. This turns out to be useful if sometimes it seems like a few functions deal with the same structure again and again. To create a new structure, we click on insert and call it some name, for example, my struct. I'm usually going to have this convention of camel case for structures here. And it creates a new structure. Now I can add new fields to the structure using D. For example, clicking D four times, actually I think maybe two times or three times, is going to give me a D word. One, two, three. One D word. Another D word. And another D word. And I can call it maybe x, y, and z. And I have a new structure. Whenever I want to use it, for example, if I see some kind of an offset, here I actually don't have this structure. I don't think I have any interesting structure here. But if you ever want to use it, you are going to use t and try to find some structure that matches. Here, of course, Nothing matches because my struct is not actually here, just an invention of mine. So some metadata about saving your work. Whenever I work with IDA, I, I save using Ctrl plus W 
and I actually click this sequence automatically from time to time because I'm afraid to lose my work like this control plus W what is actually being saved if we take a look at the files here we can see that we have x1.i64 which is a packed database and we have a few other files which represent the current open database if for example I close this file I at least I try to close this file I get this dialog which has a few propositions usually I choose punk database and click OK now let's run LS again we can see that the only two files that are left are x1 which is the original file we are actually analyzing and x1.i64 which is the packed database if I'm going to open x1 again in IDA it will first search for this kind of file and if it finds one it will continue from this database it will not create a new one let's try it Ah, I want to use actually IDA64 with X1 so it does seem like our comments are saved we didn't start from fresh new database and again if we take a look we can see all the parts of the unpacked database here x1.id0, id1 and so on in other words if you ever want to give someone else your work on IDA you should hand them the i64 file and not those files other ways to save in IDA there is a recent new technology for saving snapshots in IDA we can find it here at view database snapshot manager it allows us to save many times just to make sure let's say if you want to do something that you think might be dangerous a good idea would be to take a snapshot we can name it something like let's say snapshot of x1 and here we go it saved one snapshot we can save another one and another one and we can save whenever we want I think this also has some kind of a shortcut here take database snapshot which is control shift W let's see what it produced so we have here the three snapshots x1 and some kind of date x1 and another date and so on generally I think this is what you are going to need to use IDA in this course Th those are really the basics IDA is a very very advanced tool and along the way you are going to learn new things about it